Everybody, thanks so much for taking time out in your lunch break to talk about among the boring subjects in the world, parking is one of the most important ones. You can tell your significant other tonight. You know, I spent a scintillating lunch hour talking about parking policy, and they will they will ask you about it, and you can regale them with uh, what you've learned. You know, it's a really fascinating time in Utah when we think about how cities are changing. It's kind of a perfect storm. You know, we have we continue to be one of the fastest growing states in the country. Recently, we all have been feeling the impacts of growth in such a much more acute way, whether it's housing affordability or transportation, water use, air quality. And then you add on top of that a really dramatic shifting in market forces, the very forces that shape our cities, stemming from the internet and COVID-19 and telework and what have you. So we're gonna to talk today about what all those things mean uh, and why parking is important as we, as we think about that perfect storm. Today, uh, I'm Ted Knowlton, I'm the Deputy Director at Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, uh, I think noteworthy for me is that I am a city councilor uh, in North Salt Lake. I've been a planning commissioner and I've been a behind the desk city planner. And so I've seen how parking plays out in different kinds of setting settings. Joining me, Julie Bjornstad is the lead uh, person at WFRC that's studying disruptive trends, where the world is going and how we can adapt uh, and has been uh, working in, in parking situations, both as a consultant before joining us here at WFRC. And then lastly, we have Mark Shepard, who in addition to being the mayor of Clearfield, he's the vice chairman of the National League of Cities, and he's also the chair of WFRC's Transportation Committee. So it's a fantastic group that we've got here today. Um, likely joining us will be Meg Ryan from the League of Cities and Towns, their lead planner, will help um, us in the conversation as we move forward today. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna talk about why parking is so important and that it really makes sense for us to think about parking, not as a one size fits all, but as a custom uh, approach to the different kinds of context that we have in our cities. Then Julie's gonna drill down into the big things that have changed. Why are those market forces so different? And then she's gonna introduce this really cool uh, collaborative guide we've got, um, the Parking Modernization Guide produced by Utah's transportation agencies. Then we're gonna have an interesting conversation with Mayor Shepard that has a lot to do with how does this stuff play out in communities? Um, you know, residents have concerns, maybe, uh, you know, businesses have ideas, developers have wants and needs. How does it all play out uh, as we think about how this stuff lands in a community? Now, so parking is a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal for a whole bunch of reasons. But think about it this way. It's a lot of land. Um, in downtown Salt Lake City, we're talking about parking being about 30% of the land area in a suburban commercial setting it can actually be more like 60%, two thirds of the land. So we're talking about a lot of land. Now, land usage means it affects how much infrastructure we have to build. It affects how much revenue we are developing as a community. Users, you know, businesses need parking. Um, it's important for their customers. Uh, you know, it's, they're thinking about, you know, how do we help make, our business succeed, but they're also thinking about, well, where in a city can we go where the land is sufficient for the parking that is required? Tenants, tenants have to pay for parking. They want parking, they have to pay for parking. For moderate, moderately priced uh, apartments, each parking space adds about 12% to the rent. And so there's a little bit of a trade-off that way. Uh, tenants themselves, uh, parking is about 17% of the ongoing um, uh, rate that a tenant pays to rent a space, you know, in a in a 
in a strip mall or in an office building or what have you. And then of course, neighbors, neighbors care about it. You know, they come to think of very understandably that the parking in front of their house is sort of in a way it's theirs. And that ownership of it in their head can often be a little bit of a challenging situation to play out uh, if parking spills into those kinds of environments. And you can see this uh, headline from, uh, from Salt Lake City, another parking flare up in the latest test of ninth, ninth and Ninth's willingness to urbanize. So parking is a big deal. Getting it right is an interesting uh, question. What we'd like to put forward for you is how do we deal with parking based on the different contexts that we have in a city, in a region? Uh, now, to kind of set the stage on that question of one size not fitting all, you know, many of you might have been involved in a really interesting uh, public engagement process called uh, Guiding Our Growth. This is a statewide conversation about Utah's future. And in this, we actually had 19,000 Utahns say, this is how I think we deal with the challenges of growth, the challenge of ongoing growth. And so people were asked this basic question, where should we allow new housing? And 25% uh, of respondents said, you know, it doesn't make sense to allow uh, housing in existing communities. Orange in this graphic here represents new housing. And they said, you know, if we are going to allow housing at all, it ought to be in new communities. 25%. 75% said, yeah, we should allow housing in new communities, but we also should at least allow it in our city and town centers. And so you can see that in the bottom part of that uh, graphic there on the right. Now, one of the benefits you see is there's actually less need to develop new communities if you have more development within city and town centers. Those, in when we talk about parking, those are two very distinctly different settings. The survey itself actually tells people, you know, when it comes to parking, these are not the same. That it actually says this when you hover over an option in that survey, growth in town centers would mean parking gets less convenient. Visitors would need to walk further from parking or may need to pay for parking. It's sort of queuing up that there's a trade-off based on the setting for growth. So when we talk about city and town centers, these are places that you know that are historical, downtown Provo, Salt Lake City, Ogden, they're also new places. So the Holiday Town Center, Mill Creek Commons, um, new places that we are working on creating, whether it's uh, downtown Daybreak, Vineyards, Utah City, there's a lot of them that are happening across the entire Wasatch Front. And these are really interesting places that focus activity. They mix uses in a walkable setting. They tend to be near transportation options. Uh, and that's kind of what we mean by, by centers, city and town centers. Um, a lot of communities around the Wasatch Front had sa have said, you know, it's part of our vision to either uh, enhance the existing centers we've got or to create new city and town centers. And the framework for exploring that vision is our shared Wasatch Choice vision, which is uh, um, Southern Box Elder County, Weaver, Davis, Salt Lake, Morgan, Tooele, uh, and Utah counties, uh, in, including the Wasatch Back, Summit, and Wasatch counties. A lot of communities, Morgan, have said, look, let's explore our future city and town centers through the Wasatch Choice Framework. I'll just show that graphic there on the right to just identify that centers can vary in scale um, and they're not one size fits all even themselves. Now, centers, this idea is a really important contextual consideration for parking, but I just wanna talk for one second about the benefits of centers. You know, there was this consultant firm that did some work in Weaver County and that explored, hey, what's the difference in the, you know, the taxable value 
that we create on a per acre basis when you look at a center versus uh, sort of a more conventional um, development setting. And here you see this, this contrast that 5.8 acres of the building on the upper left, the Eccles building, would equate to about 50 acres of the Newgate Mall. So pound for pound, if we're thinking about revenue um, in our cities, revenue generation, we're thinking about economic activity for the region, and we recognize that land is scarce, then centers help us maximize that value. You can see it here. This is uh, showing you the height of an area as a reflection of its value per acre. And you can just see centers popping up in this as well. Now, so if centers themselves are a really important and interesting context for parking, I think I would put forward to you as an underlying theme for this conversation that you kind of have to treat parking in those places distinctly. And I think it's a useful construct to say that um, when it comes to parking, I can't read my own thing here, that there is an almost impossible trinity. You can kind of think of, hey, there's different things that we want from parking. We want parking to be cost efficient. In other words, it doesn't cost a lot to, per space to provide. It could be service parking. Why do we want that? Remember, uh, we don't want to have to pass on costs to renters and tenants. We want an abundant supply. We want lots of, of spaces so that we never really run out. That's another objective. And then a third objective there on the bottom is we don't want the parking itself to take a lot of space. And I would submit to you, it's really, really challenging to do all three. And we kind of have to pick what are the two that are the most important in any given context in a city. I do, however, have this modifier, the almost impossible trinity, because if you're really clever and shameless plug, you look at the parking modernization guide, we've got some tips to try to get away with providing all three. It's cost efficient, it doesn't take up a lot of space, and you have enough to meet your needs. But let me show you this um, almost impossible trinity let's take a quick tour of three places across the region. Here we have um, an area, Jordan Landing. It's a great place. It has plenty of parking. The parking didn't cost a lot per space, but it takes up a lot of land. Now, if you're trying to create a town center, you want that focus of activity, you want walkability, this isn't gonna help you create a town center. It can be a great place, not a town center. Now we're in downtown uh, South Salt Lake. Structured parking, structured parking per space can run about $30,000. It's really expensive per space. It's compact, it doesn't take up of a lot of land. You can provide plenty of parking in that setting. This is what we're looking at in this image. Lots of parking, it doesn't take up a lot of land, it's super expensive. When we're talking about expensiveness, that can drive up the rents, or it can mean that the public entities have to subsidize it somehow. Not always a trade-off that every community wants to make. And then here is the third setting. Here we are in downtown Clearfield. Mayor Shepard is gonna talk a little bit about this development. Uh, I think it's a Clearfield Junction, and I hope I didn't get the name wrong, Mayor. But here we have where you see it's cost-effective parking, it's compact, doesn't take up a lot of land, but there is a trade-off. And the trade-off is they're maximizing the sharing of parking. So this, this parking here you see between these two buildings is shared between a library and a mixed-use development. And then they also maximize the utility of the on-street parking. So three different kinds of settings. But I think importantly, it's not why one size fits all. When we're talking about a center, you kind of have to think about how do we make sure we have that land of efficient uh, kind of parking? I hope those are useful introductory thoughts here today as we jump in. Now let's drill down and think about, you know, what has really changed and how do we adjust our parking 
approaches based on how the world has changed. So I'll hand the baton over to Julie to take it away. Julie? And if I need to, Julie, first of all, you got to unmute. Okay. Okay. Thanks, host. I could not figure out a way to unmute. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I am apparently in charge of the future technologies and can't even figure out current technologies. So here we go. I'll talk today about um, today's codes why they're sort of out of date, and then um, share some ideas for helping to recalibrate them. So first we're gonna go travel a little bit back in time. Um, imagine that the year is 1950, so there are both more cars than ever and fewer people than ever going to downtown. And so how does one solve this problem? How do we get more people to take their cars to downtown? Well, the planners of yesteryear determined that this problem um, could be easily solved by increasing parking supply and then ensuring that every new development that came into a city had a minimum number of parking spaces. Um, and this would solve our, our struggling downtowns at, at the time. Um, cities codified these minimum parking requirements within their municipal codes. They look something like this. Um, tables that say for each land use um, unit, there's a required number of parking spaces. Um, and most of the time, this data isn't necessarily informed by what's actually happening in a given city, but by information in a book called the ITE Parking Generation Handbook. Um, this is produced by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. And the data within this book looks a little like this. You can see all the data points, the trend line, um, sometimes that trend line is not very fitted and what the average rate may be. And so these averages are often used as the basis for municipal codes um, and as the basis for when a development is trying to estimate how much parking they may need, um, they use this information. Until very recently, this data was from uh, mostly the 1980s and 1990s, um, and a lot of it was collected in suburban Florida. Now, as someone who grew up in suburban Florida in the 1980s and 1990s, I can tell you firsthand that Utah at the end of 2023 is quite different from Utah or some from Florida at the end of the last century, which is you know sort of issue number one: is the data that we're using um, reflective of the current uh, time that we're living? So um, the Parking Generation Handbook actually warns the user against this type of one-size-fits-all approach, which Ted had mentioned earlier. So for instance, this is um, directly from uh, one of the editions of the IT, IT handbook. And um, you know, it says specifically, right, may not be best reflect local conditions, that surveys of comparable um, local conditions should always be considered as one of the best means to estimate parking demand to uh, account for local factors. So what do we mean when we say local factors? Well, the context in which we're planning our parking varies and can vary by things like intensity of development, um, the density of the street network, the availability and frequency of the transit network, um, the ability to safely walk and bike to destinations, um, and things like whether on-street parking is available. So all of these different factors directly influence how we travel to and between destinations, and in turn, that directly impacts how much parking demand there is and how much parking supply um, we would need to provide. So not accounting for this context, you know, really does matter. It really does have real implications. Um, for instance, here's a little city some of you may have visited, um, Salt Lake City. And when one thinks about downtown, you know, usually we think of a bustle of activity comes to mind. We imagine streets with lots of restaurants and shops and little gathering places. Um, but this isn't always the case, right? And one of these reasons is that our traditional approach to parking has not considered the variety of contexts in which, you know, sort of we live our life. So um, for what some of you may consider like the urban core of Salt Lake City, that translates this sort of not realizing the context translates to about 30% of all land area within this urban core is dedicated to surface parking. Now, some of this surface parking we all know is definitely needed. Um, but we have to start thinking about whether we can start using some of this existing parking in a way that allows us to take advantage of some of the surface parking and redevelop it um, to the meet the needs of a growing region. This um, 
phenomenon is not unique to our downtowns. We see it in our suburban areas. Um, and when we were doing the Utah parking modernization study, we collected some data from around the region. Um, and so, you know, here I'm showing you Provo Town Center, Lehigh Thanksgiving Point and Farmington Station area. And so regardless of whether transit was available, distance to transit, um, we see that in a lot of our developments that were developed after these parking minimums were put into place, that just under about 50% of our land is being dedicated to surface parking. Okay, so let's do a little bit more tra time traveling. Now let's jump up to the year 1980, um, going back to our lovely capital city. So this corridor may look familiar to you. Um, each year that passes, I'm sure it looks less and less familiar to you, um, or at least less familiar to this picture. And so while some things like um, the Jiffy Lube and that Chevron still exists on this corridor, a lot has changed, right? There's now light rail. We have multi-story residential going up. The trees got their leaves back. The sun came out. Um, <laughs> Ted and I have a joke that, you know, if you wanted something to look good, you just put trees in it. Um, so, you know, as um, all of this stuff happened, right, people are moving along that corridor differently. Um, and the greater neighborhood has changed as a whole. And so with it, our approach should parking. Um, and so how we're getting around, not just in sort of our, our urban cores, not just in our transit corridors, but as um, sort of region and a nation and world as a whole is changing. We have the rise of Uber and Lyft. We have apps that allow us to pay for things from our phone, making it easier to, you know, for, to pay for parking, for instance. Um, we have a more robust bike network. E-bikes are helping people bike more often. Our transit network has been growing as we've been growing as a region. And many more of us are working remotely, right? Everyone on this call didn't travel anywhere to get to this webinar. Um, we're also probably did most of our, on, our shopping for holiday gifts online. So all of these changes are impacting how we're traveling. They're impacting when, where, and how we're parking. Um, and so this is sort of the impetus for like why we feel that right now is a time to start relooking at the way we've been doing things to our parking. Julie, I would almost um, ask those that are watching this, ask yourself if you know how old the data is that um, informs your current parking requirements. Um, there's a good chance if you don't know that it's pretty darn old. And as much as the world has changed, even if they're 10 years old, they actually might be in some ways obsolete. That's how much the world has changed. Um, so, so yeah, we mentioned the world's changing. Let's relook at some of these uh, approaches. So this is an example in the region. Um, clearly from this photo, we see the needs to park, right? We, we're seeing lots of parking utilization, but we're also seeing some areas where maybe um, those, those parking areas aren't being taken advantage of as much. And um, one of the things here is like, what can we start doing with some of this land that's being dedicated and not being used right now. So thinking about what else parking can be, um, we can think about, can this place be a place for more housing? Um, we're having housing issues right now, right? Is this a place for new parks and new libraries? Um, I beg you to think about where can we put the whale, the tail from the ninth and ninth whale? Um, all of these empty parking lots can, can be used um, maybe in ways that kind of strengthen our community. And these ideas aren't far-fetched, right? We're already seeing examples like this. You can see this is in um, in downtown, or just outside of Salt Lake. Um, this parking lot is being underutilized and um, developers have thought, well, this is a great place located next to transit. What can we do here? Um, and this development, this multifamily housing is going in right now. It's supposed to open this month, right? So we're, we're reusing um, this land in ways that strengthen and build community. Um, we are also, I want you to think about how modernizing your parking approach can aid in bolstering the visions that you've set out in your general plan. So this is from Kazel's general plan. And we have to think about whether, yeah, these codes are helping us create vibrant communities. Um, you know, and are they being innovative? Are we adapting? Are we helping improve mobility and connectivity or enriching um, our city centers and our downtowns? And are we preserving open space? Or can we do something um, where our approach to parking is helping support 
the principles that are within our general plan. So um, what are some actions that we can take? Ted already kind of mentioned this. We can move away from the one size fits all um, approach and begin to consider how our community's context and the different contexts that are within our community um, might change how we approach parking. Um, that our approach should be changing with the different contexts. Julie, can I um, do a little interjection there? I think part of the ra fundamental rationale for that is the basic idea that individuals and businesses don't have the same parking needs. Um, you know, parking needs are as diverse as our population. And even if you think of an, a, a category of land use, like a restaurant, the parking needs across restaurants can vary so dramatically. Oftentimes these wants and needs of individuals or businesses, they actually sort themselves in a way based on the, the type of context. I mean, you can imagine for your, for example, if somebody had an RV and three cars, would they pick downtown Salt Lake City? That's an example. And conversely, if somebody uh, loves to bicycle, uh, walk to the store, uh, you know, would they pick the big big box area near the interstate as where they'd live? People tend to sort themselves based on their wants and needs. And I think that's that's this fundamental notion of not having one size fit, fit all. That was great. Thanks, Ted. Um, another approach is starting to rethink how can we get the most out of our existing parking um, through things like shared parking. The imagery here is that these dogs are sharing a dog walker. Your parking can share parking lots. Uh, we can do parking districts like a one one you know park once type of place. Um, and so to start thinking of like, how can we optimize what we already have? And then another way is using um, recent data, gathering your own data to calibrate parking standards to, to your own community's needs. Um, one thing that can help with this, if you're not ready sort of to take on the challenge of using your own data, is that actually, even though I kind of bemoan the parking generation handbook earlier, um, the most recent edition actually has updated data, um, not from when and where I was growing up. Um, but data that's collect collected in the last 20 years. And you can filter um, that data by the time it was collected, the location it was collected, um, and you can help is adding in that context of whether you know you have transit accessibility, whether you are um, a place that people can bike to, is this an urban area, suburban area? Um, so the data that's in the most recent parking gener generation manual is much more comprehensive than it's been in the past. Ted. Okay, <laughs> you came off the mute. Um, and so I just want to point you also to a resource that WRC, along with the Mountain Land Association of Governments, UDOT, UTA, and Salt Lake County have recently developed to help you guide through that process. It's the Utah Parking Modernization Guidebook. Um, this guidebook contains information about the benefits of rethinking your parking, about policies and strategies that you can use, um, and contains a tool that helps you kind of walk through the context of your community and what approaches may best fit um, your community as you begin this journey. And then, Ted? Well, that was, uh, that was great. Thanks, Julie. And um, I just want to do a plug that if you've got a question anytime, feel free to go ahead and drop that in. Um, and then we will fill those uh, as we can um, here today. Let's bring Mark, uh, Mayor Shepard from uh, Clearfield into the conversation. Um, Mayor, I'm just testing your mic. Everything what? good on that? I would hope so. I, this isn't my first Zoom meeting. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I I mean I you know I I know it was Julie's, and so the little trouble with the mic. But... You know I still can't find where the screen is. Like stop screen sharing. So anyway, <laughs> we've all been there. Well, Mayor, thanks a lot for uh, um, being part of this uh, interesting conversation on one of the most important of the boring topics, uh, parking. Now Clearfield's tried some different things, uh, as I understand it. What was the impetus for Clearfield in wanting to try something different from what you've been doing with parking codes and ordinances over the last you know, decade or so? What caused you to try to do something new? 
Well, historically, any any density that density that we had has been in the, uh, the outskirts. I'll I'll say it of the city. I mean, they haven't been in our core. And so, as we put in a form based code to redevelop our downtown area, our State Street corridor, uh, we had to take a look at something because we're we're dealing with a very limited amount of land. Uh, we've you know, I mean, we've entitled or permitted or built you know, since in the last five years, roughly about 4,000 units uh, of one form or another. And so when you when you plan for 4,000 housing units, um, planning for 4,000 parking spaces is a bit of a challenge. So we've had to look at, at different ways to address that. Um, hey, Mayor, can you tell us about a project in Clearfield? I know Ted mentioned one um, where a different approach was taken with parking. Yeah, well, um, Clearfield Junction, probably our, our, our best to start with, um, because we won, it, it was it was property that we we were working with, that the city owned, we're working with the developer to make a, a project work. We'd already committed an acre and a half, roughly, of land to, or an acre of land to the library. And so Davis County was bringing in a library, the developer wanted to bring in 240 apartments. Um, not a problem, except that based on our our parking standard at that time, th there was no way to make that development work. And it's not what we wanted. We're trying to create a walkable, really walkable downtown area. And uh, and so it's a matter of getting cars off of the roads and, and making you know, making transit a little bit a little bit more accessible uh, and, and giving that walkability to a downtown area. And so we worked with the developer, reduced our parking standards significantly for that development, and then did shared parking as well with the library and a, and a cross-access agreement between the two of them so that all of that was together. We knew that a library would use parking during the day. Uh, that was, you know, their biggest portion would be used during the day, and at night their spaces would be open. That said, they have, during the day, a very heavy demand on parking, and they would have to have their own uh, specific spaces. And so, but we also realized the vast majority of their tenant of their people will walk to a library. If it's a, it's a central location, they will walk. And so it was a balance of how do we provide enough parking for, for the apartments and at the same time, reduce that, that number to where it was, it was workable. Now we, uh, you know, you ask about success um, right off the bat, we got complaints. And initially, we had some complaints from the residents, and that was understandable. We had construction going on. They're, re they're releasing one building at a time, and there's construction equipment and, and uh, supplies all over the parking that, that would eventually be there. Um, as that finished and the development was good uh, or was, was complete, we stopped hearing res uh, complaints com entirely from, from the residents of, of Clearfield Junction. We did, on the other hand, continue to hear complaints from our residents in the city. And that's been the the kind of, the, I, I want to say, shocking piece to me is that the people that are complaining about our parking at a at an apartment complex are not the people that live there. And it's because they see parking along State Street now. They see parking in front of the apartment complexes. They see businesses all along the front, which because we put commercial along State Street and then apartments above it. And then wondering, where am I going to park? Well, the, there is parking there. During the day when those businesses are, are being used, there's parking. Afterwards, that parking is taken up by tenants. And, and, it, and it, it has a good balance there because of that. How has your, you and your city council viewed on-street parking? Uh, on street parking is great. It's, you know, it in our residential neighborhoods, yes, at wintertime, we have ordinances that say you're not parking on the street during because we have snow removal. Um, along our state street corridor, that's UDOT's land. And we don't control whether or not they park there, but we're fine with it. It's there is that risk involved, certainly for a tenant. If they're parked out on the street during a snowstorm, UDOT's plowing roads. And uh, but we've also seen that as that's happened, they've moved off of the roads. And the roads end up, for the most part, clear, and we don't have to worry about it. Earlier, I was talking about that you know parking needs across the residents of a city are not the same. Um, 
how have you seen sort of the parking demand play out at Clearfield Junction that may either be the same or different from elsewhere in the city? Clearfield Junction, we have a lot of people sharing rides, um, more than I've probably seen anywhere else. Uh, it's about 75% of the tenants in Clearfield Junction are military. And so we see a lot of them sharing, sharing parking. It initially causes some huge problems because when we reduced parking by units and expected a, a, a lower amount of parking, we initially saw just the opposite. Uh, we saw airmen, because of the cost of housing, doubling, tripling, and quadrupling up in apartments, and every one of them having a car. And that was our initial problem with our with our parking. Quickly, we saw that without the parking, they started sharing cars. And one car is parked on base, and the airmen travel back and forth, and they only have one car. And so I've seen that, yeah, that that's that's humanity. If the parking isn't there, you adapt. You, you will adjust. At Clearfield Station, if I had my way, as we bring that development online with up to a thousand housing units in there, I wouldn't have any parking but street parking because you, you force people into a whole different lifestyle. I've lived out of state and I've lived in many places where you just don't park, you walk. Most don't even, don't even own a car. It's going to take us a while, I think, to get that to that kind of a status in Utah where we're we're okay not uh, not driving everywhere we go. Mayor, but, you mentioned using the on-street parking. Can you talk about how you how you count on-street parking um, when you use that to help developments meet their their parking needs? Oh, I'd have to leave that one to my planners to how we. <laughs> <laughs> okay, call Brad if you need it. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll I'll check in with Brad. <laughs> You know, this there's this interesting question of of is this uh is this kind of shift in parking, is it um is it forcing people to do something they don't want to do, or is it allowing people to not have to pay for something that they don't they don't use? And I think it's two different ways of looking at the same thing. Do you do you want to weigh in on that kind of like yeah, I, I, look at this? I, I mean, again, if 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 we didn't have parking, and, th and that's that's the overall question. And as I work with developers, they ask, ask that question all the time. Cities mandate parking, not developers. If if the developers that I work with on my real estate side of things had their way, they wouldn't. They, I mean, they wouldn't have parking at all. It'd be easy to start. They had a very limited number of spaces. And I've asked them, are you worried then that you wouldn't be able to rent that? You know, would your rents drop? And they say, no, we just rent to a different people. There would just be a different group of people that would come in with their expectations of, I ride my bike, I ride a scooter, I Uber, whatever that is, I, I don't have a car. And it's just a different clientele. In the meantime, in, in the other aspect, we provide all the parking. We know who's you know who's coming. We're bringing people in that have a need and want a per, you know a personal parking space. And, and that's just changing people's minds. I mean, it's changing the way we think, but it's also attracting people that are there that that will ride the train to work every day. You know, it's that mentality. We when we would tour, uh, we toured California, a couple of train stations in California before we before UTA started developing here. And yeah, there was no parking around their, their developments because they just expected everyone would ride the train. Now, whether they did or not, I don't know, but that there wasn't any parking because they ride the train to and from work. I'd like to also just bring in or invite in uh, Meg Ryan from the League of Cities and Towns into the conversation and just, uh, Meg, you've worked with so many different communities um, with all kinds of different needs. And I don't know if you have a, a question or a thought that you wanna weigh in on. And if you don't right now and you wanna uh, gather some thoughts, that's fine. But I wanted to just kind of give you an opportunity. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Mayor. I think Mayor, um, as you know, serving on the uh, league's board, the um, neighborhood pushback on parking changes is sort of a big thing. And I don't know if you have any advice. I know you've talked a little bit of, about the example there, but at, was your council aligned with you as well? Was it a unanimous kind of effort to, to 
try this and um, just any thoughts on that would be appreciated. It, it, it was both, both, yeah, both through our planning commission and our council, it was unanimous. Uh, it, it's that mentality of how do you, how do you create walkable communities? And, and, you know, you said, I mean, residents don't, don't love it because they're not used to it. Those that live outside of that downtown corridor have that feeling that, you know, in order to come to this, to that restaurant or to where somewhere else there, they've got to be able to park. And, and so you provide parking for that, that piece, but not in the amounts that you normally would, you know, we, we brought in a, uh, a hair salon into this apartment complex, the first business that went in and right behind it, a gym. And there is no parking. They have no parking at all other than whatever is in front of State Street. And both businesses are flourishing. They're, they're just booming. And one would ask then, okay, well, then where are your people? You know, where are they parking? And they said, well, if they drive, they park wherever they can. That's that's what they do. They want to come to our business. And they have not turned away business because they couldn't park. But that was the initial response from residents was I'll never be able to go to that business because I can't park there. So, Mary, we've seen the same thing, actually, in my neighborhood. There was a, a new trail that got put in in that um, impact. New trail, new roundabout impacted parking. And we saw one of the business owners um, very vocal in the paper, on the news, against this the bicycle improvement uh, because of re re reducing parking. It's going to ruin her business. None of the people, you know, we're a great neighborhood, but everyone who shops at her store is from somewhere outside of our neighborhood. And yet, now that that project has been in place for a couple of years, the property next to hers, she also owns and, and tore down the building and is now building an even more dense building. You know, it's going to be four, I think like four units um, on the bottom that has absolutely no, no parking on site. And so I think, you know, change is always, thinking about change is always harder than the actual change. And like you're saying, I think, you know, it's not, it's probably not as bad as you think it is. And in this case, clearly she's redeveloped, she's, she's reinvesting in the neighborhood. And so this, this apparent lack of parking actually, in her case, didn't really impact like her business or her bottom line. But, but I think there was, um, the communication with her at the beginning was probably difficult. And so I'm wondering if, if you guys have found anything helpful on how you're talking about parking or talking about this change um, with people, like with residents or, you know, business owners or other people within the community. With residents, yes, because I've had many conversations with residents and it, it, it has been, I mean, I'd, I'd love to say I just had every answer for them, but I didn't. You know, the answer was be patient. It'll, it will work out. Trust me, I know it's different. I know it's not what you're used to. It will work out just fine. We have in that in that same apartment complex a convenience store that's being built right now. No parking for the convenience store. Uh, they weren't even worried about it. Their focus was the apartment complex and said, yeah, people will come downstairs and use that. But the feedback that I'm getting from the residents around there, not the people that live in the apartment complex, but the neighborhoods around is how thrilled they are that we're putting that in. They'll walk there. And you wouldn't have thought that beforehand. Again, they're so used to getting in their cars, but I think changes, changes perceived sometimes, or, you know, the, the negativity is perceived. And I think as councils, we look at that and say, oh, my residents would never go for that. Or they'll yell at me during my council meeting, or there's a problem. And, and it's true, they will. And then they'll learn and they'll see that it does work and that it can work and people will adapt and they, they choose to. Parking's expensive, uh, you know, and it's expensive for developers. It's expensive because of that for tenants as well. When you start looking, as Ted showed, how much that impacts their their rent. But I'd love to have everybody structure park if that was the case, but at thirty thousand dollars a a space, you you start looking at a two hundred and forty unit apartment complex, and you're you're seven point two million dollars in parking. Um, that that whole complex might cost them fifty million. And you just added seven million dollars of it just to to tell them to park it. Now they get some benefit back from being able to build other things, but not to that extent. So I it's hard for developers to weigh that out. For sure. And I I I uh, used to use a rule of thumb of the land value point at which uh, structured parking starts to make financial sense. 
and it was two and a half million dollars per acre just for the land. Yes. So you can get a sense of that. Now that may not be exactly right anymore, but it gives you at least a rough sense. And that's um, and that's not that's not wrong. I mean, you know, but but land, you know, up, up, at least up in our area, you're looking at six hundred thousand an acre for for commercial land. We, we need to land to be four times that amount before they yeah. can start doing structured parking and have it make sense. There's there's a really uh, interesting and tough to unpack question that that from a uh, post to the panel. How do you balance the current needs of a commercial space? versus how needs may change in the future. Um, and then uh, this person goes on to say, for example, I've seen shuttle companies move into strip retail and then use almost all of the parking for neighboring tenants. Now there's a couple of things to unpack about this. And if you don't mind, I'll let me, let me say a couple of things about this. Um, first of all, let me tell you how uncomfortable it is as a planner or a planning commissioner to tell a business, you can't come into our city or you can't go to the site that you want the most because you don't meet parking requirements. You can't use a building that exists because you can't park it. And it's it's sort of heartbreaking for me to, to say, you know, we don't really want uh, your firm we because we need the parking more than we want your business. Um, I think one one sort of justification for um, sort of having, uh, you know, more market oriented uh, parking codes is you're acknowledging that you can't predict the future. You don't know exactly which business is going to come in next. And, and so if you're pegging your, your requirements off of something that has really high usage, and then you're basically saying then in the future, every business has to be, um, uh, you know, has to meet that kind of parking dynamic. But there's another side to this, which um, the the question gets at, well, look, if you don't have enough parking, then it may really inconvenience some of the neighboring tenants. And how do you deal with that? How do you manage um, parking demands that may spill into somebody else's space or what have you? And, you know, I'd like to open that up and see if there's some Thoughts and ideas there. I can I can weigh in on a couple, but I I'll uh, I will blessedly not for starters. Oh, go ahead, everyone. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Well, we've I, had, I mean, we've had allocated spaces, Ted, where we've had you know the development specifically out you know allocate as as you know most commercial folks will do. You know, we want X amount of spaces dedicated to us. Um, we, we see our businesses doing about half of that right now. As I work with them, our, our restaurant asked for eight spaces. It, he, he'll probably have 16, you know, cars out there. He's got 5,000 square feet of restaurant space, but he's only got eight spaces. And I asked him if that was going to be sufficient for his needs, because that's all he could get there. And he said, yeah, we'll do just fine. Um, he wasn't worried about it. I think we overpark our businesses quite often and we do things on assumptions and we, because I think we pack them into different styles of, you know, different types of businesses and say, well, this business is in this basket, but maybe isn't, you know, and, and so we have to, we make them park that according to what this basket is, you know, what this group of business type is. And yet businesses are different. And it's, we, we've been working with one right now that, uh, is a, is a tumbling gym. And they said, well, we need in two different cities said, okay, well, for this size of a building, you have to have X amount of parking spaces. And it's a large amount of parking spaces. They're in their space now and have never had more than eight cars there. But I think code in both cities requires 40, 40 spaces because of the size of their building. Well, the size of their building is because they're running up and down mats and tumbling but what is, is not taken into account is that parents drop their kids off. They never stay at that business. And so how's that going to work for them? Um, it, it's we as a city, I mean, as cities as a whole, we've said, well, it's this type of business, so it must need this much parking. And if it's this type of business and it's this big of a building, well, then it needs more parking. When in fact, it it, it, it isn't always the case. It, it's a, You've got to look at things individually. If 
if structuring doesn't pencil in an area where you're trying to create a lot of value and economic activity in a city or a lot of housing, if structured parking doesn't pencil, then you you it sort of almost boils down to you have a choice. You can have ask for a <coughs> lot of parking, surface parking, or you can strive to create efficiency as much as you can. And if you strive for a lot of parking, then you're undermining that fundamental objective of a lot of economic activity. So a lot of town centers will deal with these kinds of questions through management techniques. Um, uh, let's let's identify the the tenants that are um, the parking spaces that go to specific tenants. Let's um, let's help uh, businesses negotiate sharing arrangements. Um, let's explore providing public parking spaces in a lot just down the street that from the very nature of the fact that they're shared across lots of businesses, you don't need as many. And so they, they sort of let the market kind of function, let private industry, private uh, entities kind of negotiate with each other while finding uh, mechanisms to provide for parking need in really highly efficient ways, again, through through public parking spaces. And so the playbook for a town center is just different than for another part of, of a city is, I guess, part of the way I would uh, get at that. You know, um, Julie showed in, in her graphic of how the world has changed the, and maybe you can find it and pull it up, Julie, those boxes that the upper left is something that you're starting to see businesses do a lot more often where they're thinking, oh, parking is constrained. I'm going to actually go ahead and make a little money off of it. And it's private industry doing that. Um, and then because parking is just sort of parking demands are malleable, that can send signals to others to say, look, the context here is a little different. It's a naturally more constrained parking environment. And we get a benefit from it. We get more development activity um, and we tend to align those in our community that like that way of living, that this is their spot. Um, but it's just not, it's just not, uh, it's basically not a one size fits all kind of approach. It's sort of purposely saying, look, we use a different playbook in this area. Um, I have a question for both you, Ted, as a council member and, and the mayor. We have a question about um, when there's disagreement on a council about a direction that that should where we should be heading, um, where maybe a minority is asking for you know a re a relook at parking, maybe less parking, um, and the majority is kind of you know content with with how things are. How do you have that conversation? What are the actions that that someone can take to kind of you know begin to to relook at this? Again, I think it's learned um, histories. It's it's it, the things that we're we're doing is we've learned along the way, and so I think most of it is just education in in talking through with your council as to how do you how do you do this? Can it be done differently? Um, doing a simple parking study is is good, um, you know, on a on a city basis, uh, just just to know what you know what your needs truthfully are. Um, but I think a lot, like I say, a lot of our activities, a lot of our, our mentalities are just learned and just need to be rethought. And that's hard. Change, change sucks. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> we get, we've got million, you know, thousands and thousands of people moving to the Wasatch Front and it is what it is. They're coming and we should be thrilled with that. But at the same time, it's change and it's going to make things different. We have to look at what we do differently. We have another question about this change and how when people, you mentioned that people are starting to use on-street parking more, the neighborhood isn't used to seeing maybe that use um, and maybe think of it more as a nuisance and kind of begin to oppose multifamily develop development. How how are, how are can one work through with the, with the community to work through these concerns about sort of on-street parking now being used as on-street parking? Do you, oh. do you have any idea? <laughs> well, I, I, 
Yeah, um, Ted. Well, I, 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 it's tricky, and and it's a very real concern. Uh, spillover parking is is you know very understandably not politically a popular thing to have, um, and uh, you know some communities they deal with that at the back end. They put in residential permit programs. Um, I think I'm a big fan of that. Like, let's make sure that the the spaces in neighborhoods stay for the residents. Um, I don't think communities should shy away from that. Um, I also think that uh, it it does beg the question of, are you doing what you can what you can in your town center to provide the most efficient parking uh, that you can, which is public parking. Public parking. Uh, can be, um, we call it a park once district often, um, can be, because it is so visibly shared across so many businesses, it can tend to absorb demand like a really effective parking sponge. Um, and so, you know, if, you, if you're having parking problems in your town center, but you're relying on a fragmented set of individual parking lots, see if you can explore uh, buying or obtaining some public parking that you can maintain and and help take care of the problem in that way to alleviate some of the this the spillover parking. We've Again, actually discussed that, I think Ted. That, yeah, I already said it. Go ahead, Mayor. No, yeah, we've 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 discussed that that exact same thing. That as we continue to develop our along our state street corridor and our form based code area, that the city needs to look at those. We just purchased two different houses right next to our development that's coming in. The anticipation is that that will be parking, whether that is just surface parking or whether that is you know, in some way structured parking, it's to allow that access for walkability downtown in our corridor. We wanna support the businesses that are there. There's, do we need some parking somewhere? It doesn't need to be right next to the business, but it needs to be somewhere where they can from there walk. It was interesting to be in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago for the National League of Cities Conference. And I'm we're downtown and looking at their, uh, the uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium and and the uh, both of their sporting arenas right next door to each other. And I looked and said, where's, where's the parking? And there just wasn't any. And it's because they park outside of the downtown area and then take transit in. There are lots of parking structures not right smack in the core. And then they, because it wasn't the best use of their land. And so they park outside and then they take the train in. Uh, it was interesting to see that that they'd adapted to that in that sense to put two massive stadiums there that feed I mean, Mercedes sits seventy two thousand people, and there's not seventy two thousand parking spaces out there. Thanks, Mayor. Let's do rapid fire one parting thought uh, per person, and then Julie's going to provide some wrap up comments. And my my um, parting thought is: look, there's a different playbook for a town center. But let's say you, you're not interested in a town center. I think the, the basic idea of um, modernizing parking is that the world has changed so much, you really ought to go back and take a look at the latest data, even if you're not interested in a town center. So a lot of this is kind of revolved around that conversation of town center. But you know, last plug, just get recent data and then think about how it applies to your community. Um, let's go uh, Meg, Mayor Shepard, and then uh, Julie will take us home. Yeah, to all the planners online, just try to keep reaching out to your council and all the council members online. Try to listen to your planners, see if you can start moving forward. Is that me? <laughs> okay. I, I mean, my comment would be, you know, think forward, you know, be, be more forward thinking. You know, we had a, a conversation, somebody on, online had asked about uh, uh, paid parking on streets. And I'm a hundred percent for it. I've been advocating for it, but yet our parking study that came back and said, well, it really wasn't necessary right now. And my mindset is I'm not looking at right now. <laughs> I'm looking at, let me put it in place now so that I can solve a problem down the road and people will adapt. And if I've got paid parking along my state street corridor, then I've got paid parking along my state street corridor. And if the businesses want to waive that fee for them or, or pay for their parking, that's, that's entirely up to them, but it's change and change is hard. And, but we've got to be forward thinking, but you, you trying to do this retroactively just doesn't work. 
All right, perfect. Great thoughts, guys. And I apologize to everyone who asked the question we didn't get to. We'll do our best to, to answer those um, in a follow-up email. But um, for now, in terms of sort of how can we get how can we get the conversation started in your community? Um, we like to say there's no better time than now to take your community's future in your hands, uh, modernize your parking. There's three sort of uh, main ways to get started. Start sharing. Um, if if you're in the WPRC area, we're happy to come talk to planning commissions or city councils, helping to get that conversation starting about um, parking modernization. WFRC has ordinance assistance and auditing programs. We're happy to look at your code, um, highlight some areas where maybe um, we're not taking into context an account, maybe where some data could be updated. And then we have the TLC program here at WFRC. MAG has um, the MAG technical assistance grant tag, MAG tag. And um, UDOT has technical assistance as well for areas outside the MPOs. You can use that technical assistance to do parking studies um, and do this modernization work. I'll show you, um, if you're interested in the parking modernization guide, you didn't see in the chat, if you go to wasatchchoice.org, um, under resources up here at the top, you'll get to um, the parking modernization guidebook. Within that guidebook, um, it looks like this. You can see the table of contents. Um, and as you go, you know, there's lots of resources about the background, why this is important, um, you know, policies. There's also a tool that you can use. Um, you input your, the, your area's context, um, what some strategy options and policy options that you're interested in exploring. And from that, there's a range and reduction of um, how much parking you can reduce at a given development based on those strategies that you have in place or the strategies that you, you want to explore further. Um, also, I'll just, um, it's 2024 in a few weeks, and I'm going to steal this from Ogden City. We're going to park like it's 2024, and that means that um, we're committed at WPRC to help you do that. We're interested, we're have some more technical trainings coming up, more webinars. If there's something you want to explore and um, deeper through an additional webinar, please leave it in either the question and answer or chat it to us so we can start having some ideas of what's interesting to you. Um, we and the League of Cities and Towns are planning some parking mobile tours, um, which will be very interesting looking at you know different parking strategies. Um, and then we're happy to provide trainings with your, your commission, your councils, and as always, if you yourself have undertaken um, something like this, please share it with us so that we can share it back out, update our websites for more um, information sharing, for more examples for others. Um, in the chat, we had that Lehigh uses drones to take, um, to assess parking data. And so that's, for instance, that's a type of sharing that we would love um, everyone to know. So that's sort of what the next year looks like for us on the parking front. And we hope that you stay engaged and um, you have any questions or you want to get started, let Ted or myself know um, as well. Thanks, everybody. Have a safe day.